right, we're going to get started here. Um, welcome to our virtual field days. This is our third one this week, um, which we're very excited to be able to bring to you. Obviously, we would much rather be in the actual field, but since we can't do that this year, we are bringing the field to you. So let's get started. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we dive in. Um, all the participants have their audio and video turned off during the webinar, so don't worry, you're not going to randomly pop onto the screen or anything. Um, if you'd like to ask a question throughout the session, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, and you can use the chat function as well, but the Q&A is just as easy. The Q&A will be monitored throughout the session. And um, so what we're going to do is play our videos first, and then uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end. So you can put the questions in anytime, and they will be answered at the end. Uh, another little tidbit, um, we do have some videos to play. And just the way it works with the technology, uh, they might be a little bit jumpy at the beginning, but they should smooth out. We are offering pesticide points today. Uh, so one pesticide point in pest management is awarded for this session. Um, you should have registered your pesticide applicator's license um, at registration and received a receipt as an email. Uh, please keep this and submit it when you submit for renewal. So today's topics, we have weeds in wild blueberries, weeds in strawberries, and weeds in apples. We're on a bit of a theme. And our excellent panelists today, uh, we have three of Perennia's specialists. So we have Hugh, who is our uh, wild blueberry specialist, Jen, our manager for, for um, horticulture, and Michelle, who is the tree fruit specialist. Also joining us today is Gavin Graham, and he is the weed management specialist with the New Brunswick Department of Agriculture, Aquaculture, and Fisheries. So we will dive right in and get started with um, a video on wild blueberry weeds with Hugh. Hello everyone, my name is Hugh and I'm the Wild Blueberry Specialist with Poenia. Today we will, I would like to take you for a tour in the Wild Blueberry Field and we are going to look at some interesting weeds commonly found in Wild Blueberry Fields in Nova Scotia. Okay, let's go! So first of all, just a little bit background about Wild Blueberries. Wild Blueberries are managed under a unique two-year production cycle and weed management is a major production challenge due to the lack of tillage and crop rotation. Weeds are a key limiting factor in wild blueberries production and contribute significant variation to annual yields. Weeds also reduce berry quality and interfere with harvesting process. Therefore, it is important to understand weed competition in wild blueberries so a proper management plan can be made. From past experiments and when I conduct a weed survey in wild blueberries from 2017 to 2019, as well as talking to local blueberry growers, there are some weed species that are commonly found in the field and they bring management challenges to growers. And so the reason why I picked this field for a tour is because this field contains most of the weeds that I want to show you today. And you can see the grasses and the golden law from the fire. So we're going to talk about each weed individually um, in the next few minutes. I often bring these two reference books with me to the field for weed identification. So the first one is Identification Guide to the Weeds of Quebec and the second one is a Pocket Guide to IPM Scooting in Wild Blueberries. I strongly recommend you to have these two books if you are interested to know more weed knowledge. So in general, Wild Blueberry Fields contains mostly 
herbaceous and woody perennials as well as some perennial grasses. And first one I would like to introduce is hair fescue, which is this guy here. You can see it. Um, so hair fescue is a turf forming perennial grass of great concern to low bush blueberry growers. Hair fescue produced and spread by sea with individual plants pro producing up to 3,000 seeds. Seeds lack of primary dormancy and new seedlings emerge in the autumn following the seed rain. Seeds shatter easily from panicle inflorescence and secondary dispersal of non-dormant seeds by harvesting equipment. Hair fescue is common in wild blueberry fields. Also, you can see it commonly in the roadside when you're driving. And this field I pick is lack of weed management. So you can see it from a video. Those light brownish color, they are full of hair fescue. And hair fescue is very hard to manage. Also, during harvesting season, which is right. So this is a part of a field that full of hair fescue. Next we I want to show you is red sorrel. In a recent weed survey, red sorrel was found in 97.6% of survey fields. Red sorrel is an herbaceous perennial that reproduced by seeds and extensive shallow horizontal roots. It is distinguished by its arrow shape, um, arrow shape leaves. The creeping horizontal roots give rise to above ground shoots that often form dense patches. Red sorrel is the most abundant weed species in wild blueberries. And I'm just going to show you here quickly of their seeds. So those seeds will drop into the, the ground and form a new plant next year. Next I want to show you is some golden rose species in wild blueberries. So golden roll are very common in wild blueberries as well. And so there are many different kinds of golden roll species. So for example, nail leaf golden roll, Canadian golden roll, and broad leaf golden roll. And the most common and dominant species is nail leaf golden roll. So just try to pick the right one to show you here. Okay, so we see a little patches of a narrow leaf golden roll in this dry way. And that is the broad leaf golden roll. So the, the way you can tell from narrow leaf and broad leaf is the shape and size of their uh, leaves. So narrow leaf golden roll is a herbaceous plant on thin branch stems. So leaves are alternated, simple, long, narrow, long and narrow, much like grass leaf. One plant can produce many small yellow flower heads, flat top areas, sometimes as much as of 30 centimeters across. And they are very, very common to see in, uh, in blueberry fields. As you can see from far, this whole patch is um, full of golden rose species. And besides these three common weed species in wild blueberry fields, we also see some other common weeds, for, for example, the turf vetch. So those are plants that produce purple flower during their um, growing season. So turf vetch is a perennial and they're reproducing by seeds and by by seeds and by spraying underground root stocks. So that's their flowers uh, when they're in the produce um, growing seed. Species to identify and in this field, I can see uh, Canadian bluegrass and I also see some uh, tickle grass, which is a uh, rough hair grass. I'm trying to pick the right spot to show you. Okay, there we go. So that is the rough hair grass and when they are forming the patch, 
and at the end of their growing season, you can see some pinkish patches um, around them. So due to the limited time I have for this video, I only can introduce some of the uh, important weeds in wild blueberry fields. But there are a lot of weeds species present in wild blueberries. According to the recent weed survey, 211 weed species were identified in wild blueberries from 2017 to 2019. So as I say, weed management is a major production challenge and understand we competition in wild blueberry is critical to make a better management plan. And this field contains mostly uh, hair fescue and golden low species as well as some of uh, grasses for example Canadian bluegrass, black hair grass um, and also some uh, woody perennials like birch. You can see a little patch over there. Yeah, so that's it for today's tour. So thank you for taking time to tour the field with me and I hope you enjoy this video. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach me. Thank you. Alright, that was a great video on wild blueberry weeds. Um, up next, we're going to hear some information on a trial that we were doing. Um, anyway, I will let Jen explain during the presentation, but yes, up next we have uh, Jen Haverson. Hi, I'm Jen Haverstock, the manager of horticulture with Perennia Food and Agriculture. And today I'm joined by Gavin Graham, the weed management specialist with the New Brunswick Department of Agriculture, Aquaculture and Fisheries. And we're going to talk about fall strawberry herbicides and really take a look at group 14s. Um, and this past season, uh, fall 2019 into the spring summer of 2020, then we did a demo trial uh, with four different products uh, that we're going to discuss today. And as you all know, strawberry weed management is uh, complicated to control um, and it involves a lot of uh, footwork on the grower side, scouting and doing weed identification, which are important in helping you to determine the best product to use. Um, your program should really focus on controlling your dominant weeds and then preventing the spread of others and involves the use of kind of a base program that you develop from the beginning it might involve Sinbar, Devernal, Simazine, um, those types of products. Um, and then really you're looking to go in afterwards and supplement those with additional products that really target the problem weeds that you're having. And those group four, the group 14s fall into those other products. Uh, we also want to make sure that we're always maximizing efficacy by using products at appropriate times and according to recommendations. And when it comes to these group 14s, the reason I'm stating that is that they are very specific timing and how they're used um, really are things that we have to consider. And as always, uh, resistance management is important and there's always for potential for resistance to develop. So it should be used in rotation with other herbicide groups. So our group 14s are PPO inhibiting herbicides and so essentially they uh, disrupt cell membranes and that is their mode of action. Um, they do only control a narrow list of weeds. So as I mentioned this is kind of layered into the rest of your base program and is used to target problem weeds that you're having and, and supplement everything else that you're doing. Um, they do offer us an opportunity to do early season weed control. 
So you'd apply them either in late fall or early spring, and hopefully that keeps you out of the field uh, for weeding for a little bit into the spring, if not a little bit later um, as well. The plants must be dormant with the application of group 14s, and I really can't stress that enough. Um, Off-label use of the products can result in unacceptable crop injury and potentially yield loss. And if this product comes in contact with any dormant structures, then um, there is a high risk of injury. So definitely, if you want to make sure that your plants are dormant and that you're using any drift control measures so that it's not drifting into um, crops beside your planting. They are used typically in the fall and right before you're laying straw. And really, that's your benchmark is that you look at when you would typically be laying straw in your fields and then work backwards um, to determine when you need to apply these products. Now, the next question that I often get from people is how to determine when my plants are dormant. There is no easy answer to this question. There's no ideal temperature or specific temperature. Um, it really varies by location and you definitely know better than I do what your particular location uh, looks like or what your field looks like. So the field has experienced a couple of hard frosts already. The strawberries are starting to look flat. So if you look to the picture on the right, then you can see that they're all co quite close to the ground um, and the leaves collapse around the crown or fall over um, and again, give you that flat look. Some varieties do turn red when dormant, but not all. So while it is an indication for specific varieties, then it can't be your go-to for knowing that something or that the variety is dormant. So what did we do? We were looking at comparing four different group 14 products, Gold 2XL, which is a familiar one to most, Chateau, which is becoming increasingly popular, Authority 480, which um, the name is known, but not necessarily used often. And then Reflex, which is a newer product on the market and was kind of the, the reason why we wanted to do part of this uh, demonstration was to look at Reflex and compare it against the other three products. You can only use one group 14 per growing cycle. So if you do a fall application, you cannot do a spring application on the same planting. Um, and we recommend only using one group 14 per growing cycle. So the growing cycle is essentially that you would only apply it once per crop. So if you decided to carry your cover your crop over for several years, then you would only get to apply that product once. Some of the labels have a one in two year language to them, but there hasn't been any work done locally um, to verify that. So it's better safe than sorry just to go with one application per crop. And most of these products do require some crop rotation considerations because of residue carryover. So make sure that you read the labels carefully to note residue carryover time and what crops might be susceptible. And so this would come into play if you took your crop out in August after harvest um, and we're going to put in a cover crop then you may need to look at what is um, maybe susceptible to injury from the residue. So the next few slides, we're just going to go through kind of the pros and cons of each of the products that we used in the demo um, and also look at the target weeds and point out any unique features to each of them that may help in your considerations for which product suits your program the best. And we're going to start with the Goal 2XL. This is a familiar product for most. If you haven't used it, then you at least, or don't regularly use it, then you've likely used it in the past. It's a one application only in the fall applied pre-mulch to your dormant plants. The PHI is 150 days, which seems like a long time, but when you do a fall application, then it gives you plenty of room for your uh, strawberry production. The REI is actually unique in this group, um, as all the others have a 12 hour REI, but the 24, even though it's longer than the others, is really should not be limiting factor at all, uh, but it is just something to consider in case you wanted to do an application and get in there the next day to put your straw on. This product does need to be incorporated with water, or at least it's recommended to be. 
Um, and on the label, it, it specifies rain or 20 to 40 millimeters of water by irrigation. And prior to weed em emergence will improve herbicide incorporation. Um, there is a fine line here between heavy rainfall or heavy irrigation and putting on rain and the 20 to 40 millimeters. Um, and so you really do not want to have heavy rain in the forecast following the application because it will reduce the effectiveness of the product. This herbicide will also provide both post-emergence and residual pre-emergence weed control. And to ensure effective post-emergent weed, weed control, then apply when the weeds are in the two to four leaf stage and actively growing. And another thing that makes this product unique is its control of the field pansy and wood sorrel. And these are not captured by any of the other group 14 products that we're going to talk about today. Um, there are, of course, lots of conditions on the label, so please review the label before proceeding with application. The next product we're talking about is Chateau WDG. It is still considered a newer product on the market, but there appears to be a big uptick in its use over the last several years, and most of you will have either used it or your neighbors used it and you've heard about it, uh, so it is familiar. It can be used in the late fall or early spring, but based on local experience, spring applications can be a bit tricky. Um, the broadcast applications need to be made to dormant strawberries, which is pretty hard to determine um, in the spring. So really, I know speaking for Gavin, then both of us agree that the, the fall is just a better time to go in with this product. There is a recommendation on the label or registration on the label that you can use it in non-dormant strawberries, but the applications have to be made to row middles, not come in contact with any green material. So it would be going on with a hooded or shielded sprayer. But again, I think, um, we feel as though the, the fall application is really the safer bet with this product. Some additional considerations is that this that Chateau cannot be applied on soils with greater than 5% organic matter or fine textured soils. And similar to the goal, it is activated by moisture. So it needs to be applied before rainfall or uh, be followed with an irrigation. And the irrigation volumes is are 0.5 to 1 centimeter of water if no rain is expected. But again, the fine line of you need some water, not a lot of water, so don't flood the fields and don't apply before a heavy rainfall is expected. Now, one other recommendation on the product label for Chateau is not to do any mechanical disturbance or cultivation post application. Um, and that includes in the spring, is you really don't want to be running anything through the field, um, and that, that has a big impact on the efficacy of the product. And this is a pre-emergent herbicide, and it does recommend that the field is clean prior to application, and it does offer residual control to susceptible weeds as they germinate. And the next product is Authority for AT. Um, it can be applied in the spring or fall as a broadcast or banded dormant treatment to strawberries. Um, again, applications to strawberry plants with newly emerged growth is not recommended due to leaf burning and possible stand loss. So again, this is a dormant spray. And so if you cannot guarantee or are not confident that your plants are dormant in the spring, the fall application is likely the best timing for you. There are quite a few rate recommendations and considerations on this label based on pH and soil organic matter content. So make sure to read the label thoroughly and uh, consider if it fits with your particular site. Um, so for example, it says do not apply to coarse textured soils, um, do not apply in fine textured soils with less than one and a half percent organic matter, do not apply in soils with greater than six percent organic matter, so it is good to, to check out the label, um, particularly looking at those, those specific things. Um, and similar to Chateau, this is a moisture activated product. So again, we're going back to do not flood the soil, but it does need to have some water applied after its application. Um, and it should not go on frozen fields. Now Authority only offers a pre-emergent um, activity. So meaning that it does not control emerged weeds. So you're really looking to get it on. Um, it is a soil activated one. 
for the weeds listed. Now the final product that we're going to talk about is Reflex. There is limited experience with this product and so therefore kind of less confidence recommending it and it is part of the reason behind this demo trial. So not a lot of local experience or knowledge on this product has resulted in just Gavin or myself not being confident in recommending it to growers. And it does say strawberry cultivars um, may vary in their tolerance to this herbicide, but it's similar to other labels in the fact that they just haven't tested it on all varieties and they do recommend um, that you do a test plot when trialing this product before using it um, in your field. Similar to the other products, it has a one application uh, either in the fall or early winter to dormant plants. And one of the unique things to this product is that it does provide uh, post and pre-emergent weed control, but the label indicates that it does do post-emergent on all the target labeled weeds in the list on the right-hand side, um, but it is only does a few of the, the weeds for pre-emergent. So the red root pigweed and the common ragweed both also have some pre-emergent control. Out of our group, this is actually the only contact herbicide. Um, so therefore, you need good coverage and ample penetration of your canopy to obtain acceptable weed control. And to ensure this, post-emergent application should be made once the main flush of weeds is complete and that you are seeing the weeds at the three to four true leaf stage um, and actively growing. And to ensure that good coverage, then it's also recommended that you use a non-ionic adjuvenant, and we used Agrel um, in our trial. For now to have a look at the results from the demo site and to explain a little bit about what we did, uh, we actually did the demo on two sites in Nova Scotia, one in the Annapolis Valley and one in the central region of the province. Um, and we decided to layer our treatments with Sinbar and the main rationale behind this is that Sinbar is used in most growers base programs and we felt as though this was most representative of what is actually done in the field. Similar to some of our group 14, Sinbar is a soil residual herbicide, um, but it actually is a group 5, so it, that leads to our, a little bit of our resistance management with a different product. And the growers did their Sinbar applications, um, notified us, and then we followed with our treatments. And these were all done as a late fall pre-mulch. So we did make sure that they were dormant sprays and conferred with the growers to make sure that they were in agreement that their plants were dormant when we went in for our application. Um, and the mulch went on um, within a few days of our treatment applications. And the big question, was there a clear winner of the four products in our group 14 demo? Uh, and unfortunately, no, there was not a significant difference um, in any of the treatments in terms of their weed control percentage per plot. Um, but we did notice that there was a species difference between what weeds were controlled by each product uh, by plot. Uh, now, having said that, we did find that Chateau and Goal appeared to perform slightly better than the authority and the reflex. But again, this really depends on what the problem weeds are in your field or in the plot that we were dealing with. And the problematic weeds that we had, uh, we had common groundsel at one site and goldenrod at the other. And it appeared as though the gold 2XL apl applied in the late fall did appear to delay the groundsel development in the spring. So we did see a delay in when it was showing up in that particular field. And groundsel is actually found on the authority label as well. So it was interesting to see that the goal performed a little bit better on this particular weed than the other one. So seeing that our results were not all that inclusive, conclusive from our demo, uh, then really the question still is, which one do you use of these group 14 products? Um, and if there aren't any specific weeds that you're chasing, then really it comes down to price. Um, and you still do need to consider the weed populations that you commonly manage, even if um, it's not a particular problem that year. Uh, there is more local experience with the Gold 2XL and Chateau WDG. So although they're 
a more expensive product than most growers have used them before and are therefore just more confident in, in how to use them. Um, if you are encouraged by the information you saw today about authority or reflex and think that they may fit a little bit better into your weed control program, then I would definitely encourage you to give them a try. But as always, then do a test plot with those products before applying them to your entire field and probably even try them on a couple different varieties to see how they react. And finally, a lot of this information is found on the different product uh, labels that I've presented today, but for additional information on weed management, then we have a berry blog that you can follow. And then on the Perennia webpage, we also have some, a variety of fact sheets on very specific weeds that um, are problematic in managing and giving you some recommendations on understanding how that, that weed uh, cycle is and some concepts on how to manage it. And then finally, Gavin also does a fantastic publication called the Strawberry IPM Weed Management Guide. Um, this was last updated in 2017 but it sounds as though he may be looking to update it in the coming season. So hopefully we'll be looking at a new guide for 2020. And I'm happy and wanted to thank Gavin for advising on this demo trial. And then he's also gonna participate in the Q&A at the end of the presentation. So thank you very much for your time. All right, for our final stop on our virtual field day tour, uh, we're going to head into the orchard with Michelle. Hi, I'm Michelle Cortens, the tree fruit specialist with Perennia. In this short segment, we're going to look at some weeds up close. The most important time for weed control in orchards is from bud break to 30 days after full bloom because maintaining a weed free strip during that time has the greatest impact on tree growth and yield. And then on young plantings, it's also important to maintain good weed control during July and August to encourage more growth. And studies have shown that weed competition during this time can have a significant negative impact on the early cropping of young blocks. This year, the lack of rainfall means that moisture is a limiting factor, and the weeds, well, they compete with trees for water. Growers have been interested in learning to identify weeds, especially at their early growth stages, when herbicides are most effective. So this spring, as weeds were unfurling their first leaves, I started to track their growth and development. First is fleabane. The fleabane seedling forms a rosette, meaning that the stem develops very little, so the plant actually grows close to the ground. And the first leaves on fleabane are entire, so the edge of the leaf is smooth without any teeth on it. The leaf shape is round to oval. When the mature leaves form, they show more distinguishable features. They're elongated and some leaf margins have large teeth. And one key feature is that they're very hairy with white upright hairs. Leaves alternate one after another in an ascending spiral. Now going on to the mature plant, the stem develops and it's noticeably hairy still. The leaves even have a few hairs close to the stem. And the shape of the leaves is dramatically different from the seedling stage. The stem leaves are slender and they don't have any teeth. Here are the daisy-like flowers that you might recognize as this plant gets much older. It can grow very tall, reaching up to one meter in height. So you can imagine how that can compete with young trees. Next is lamb's quarters, and it's also very common in orchards. The lamb's quarter seedling has a stem, so it is raised from the ground level. The first two to four leaves are opposite each other, but the following leaves alternate. And a key feature of lamb's quarters is the powdery iridescent film on the newest leaves that can appear purple or pink. Also note that the cotyledons are long and narrow and they can be sometimes purple underneath. The first leaves are triangular to oval and more mature leaves start to develop wavy toothed margins. The mature leaves are more clearly triangular and have relatively larger tooth sizes. 
Flowers are small and green, arranged at the ends of branches. Overall, it can grow very tall and even compete with young trees for height. Another plant called spreading atriplex looks similar with the powdery appearance, but it can be distinguished by the different leaf shape. The mature leaves are elongated and they have two very distinct large teeth at the base of the leaf blade. Next is chickweed, and it can easily establish in the tree row because it's shade tolerant and therefore it's a good competitor. It also grows early in the season like a mat on the orchard floor and it robs trees of ground applied nutrients. So the seedling has a stem and the leaves are arranged opposite to one another. The young and mature leaves are all pretty much similar being entire and oval but with a pointed tip. Now moving on to the mature plant, it has a round stem and it has a line of short hairs that actually flips from one side to the other at the internodes. And the plant grows creeping low to the ground and forms thick patches. The flowers are white and petals are deeply split in a V shape. Not to be confused with mouse-eared chickweed, which is much hairier. So this segment is just the start of some resources on weed identification. Stay tuned for more. Also this year, we introduced a new guide to weed management for tree fruit crops in Nova Scotia. You can find it on our website. The crops in the guide are apple, pear, cherry, peach, and plum. Registered products are listed in calendars for orchards of various ages, including the year of planting, young non-bearing plantings, mature bearing orchards, and apple tree nurseries. Also, for more information about herbicides and weed control in orchards, check out the Orchard Outlook podcast in Season 1, Episode 5, Winning at Weed Control, with guest Kristen Obeid. Thanks for listening. All right, thanks for that. Um, if anybody hasn't checked out the Orchard Outlook podcast yet, I highly recommend it. Even if you're not an apple grower, there's lots of really good uh, transferable information there. All right, so that concludes all of our videos and it brings us into a discussion, question and answer period. So if anybody has any questions, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and otherwise, I will open the floor for comments from our panelists. Gavin, maybe you can comment on um, the kind of the most challenging, Jen mentioned that it was very challenging um, to do weed management in strawberries. So maybe you can comment on um, like what is the most critical time and why is it important it, that we do it so well? <laughs> yeah, you know, well, I guess for weed control and strawberries, it's hard for, I guess, two reasons. One is uh, our herbicide toolbox is pretty limited and uh, there's some sensitivity, especially with Sinbar's the, the main one that uh, most growers rely on and uh, strawberry varieties and timings can be hard to manage with that product sometimes. So that's where it can come into play that uh, the herbicides are pretty narrow in their control spectrum and pretty narrow on when you can apply them safely to the crop. Uh, so that uh, does make it a, a bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. And then strawberries themselves are not very uh, competitive with those weeds. Uh, so it, it can be a challenge that way. All right, um, we do have a question about what would be effective to manage buttercup in strawberry fields. Yeah, buttercup's another one of those uh, really uh, challenging ones to to try to manage. Uh, if you've got, uh, if you're able to get the seedling ones, uh, I'm just going to pull up my information here just to make sure uh, getting the the right one. But uh, Devernal can work on new seedlings if you get it on uh, when they're first just starting to come, and then uh, Curb's the other one that uh, uh, may come into play as well. Uh, Devernal is probably, uh, I've got a little bit more confidence in, in that one, uh, but that do keep in mind that it has to be new seedlings uh, for that one. 
so if you've got big established plants, uh, especially most of the time, that's what you're dealing with with buttercup, unfortunately. Uh, so you may have to look at some spot sprays or some hand weeding to, to manage it ahead of time and then uh, move it over after that. Okay, great. Um, we have a, a question for Hugh now um, about timing for curb on blueberries. Can you comment on that? Hello, it's Hugh here. So for applying curb, it has some uh, requirements. So just make sure the temperature should be below 10 degree Celsius and the ground shouldn't be frozen when you apply curb in the fall in, in blueberries. Okay, great. Um, Hugh mentioned a couple of um, weed guides and those are definitely useful across um, all crops. So the I'm not sure. Where do you get the pocket guide, Hugh? I don't know. Um, one. I just know the Quebec one. The WP and the Wild Blueberry Association kind of give, uh, give that to us. But the Quebec a week book, I checked the website. It's out of stock. But if you want, you can throw it into the Dial AC bookstore. I'm sure they have some for new students. <laughs> OK. Um, we can, I'm sure they'll get it back in stock at some point. So um, we can put the, the link to, um, to the Quebec guide. In, yeah. Um, yeah. in our follow-up information. Well, for wild blueberry growers, you should get that pocket guide uh, with you because that contains uh, weeds, disease, and uh, other management um, in wild blueberries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely some, some great guides there. All right, we have a, uh, a question for Michelle. How is fleabane responding to common herbicides uh, that are currently being used in orchards? So I have not heard of any situations where the flea bane is um, out of control or not being controlled by the common herbicides, uh, which is good news so far. But uh, I know our colleague, Sunny Murray, uh, did want to take some flea bane samples this year, just um, uh, trying to find out if there was uh, any resistance developing. It's just not something we've really explored here yet. Um, and also I'll say that the department is doing some weed surveys in orchards this year. So I'll be really interested to see their results and uh, if they have any comments on the types of weeds and the distributions in the orchards. So it's kind of a, a straight, stay tuned and see. It's something we haven't really uh, dove into recently. Mm -hmm. What would you say in just in your travels through the orchards, um, what are kind of the, the big ones for you, the most problematic? Yeah, like the main ones that I went through in the video, like the, the lambs quarters, the flea bane, um, yeah, and the pigweeds, ragweeds as well. Like they can get really, really tall, uh, you know, up to yeah. a meter in height. And, uh, you know, they release thousands of seeds if they're allowed to go to, mm -hmm. to seeds. So those can be um, pretty difficult in young plantings, actually, especially in a dry year that we had this year. They really compete for moisture. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Gavin, again on the strawberry buttercup issue, um, what would you recommend, or Jen, uh, what would you recommend spot spraying? Yeah, for the spot spray, you're pretty much limited to the, the glyphosate products would be your best bet. So that's where, you know, the most of the time that buttercup's growing right within your strawberries though. So uh, you, you do have to make the decision that, you know, maybe sometimes it's take that piece of the row out uh, and, uh, and it's it's not going to have plants for you anymore or just try to manage it or or keep the keep it in a smaller section if you can uh especially if you're dealing with the creeping buttercup the the, the smaller one that crawls around a little bit more it can take over a, a row pretty quickly if you're if you're not going to try to stop it mm -hmm. okay all right hugh back to you um we have a question that says opinions seem to differ on whether or not there should be some weeds left in the field or if it's really best to have a completely weed free uh, field. So if you can have a pristine field without overtreating herbicides, would that be the best or what would you suggest there? Well, in ideally, everybody wants to have a weed free field to have. Oh, sorry, I missed the question. No, I you just said answer, so I don't see it. Okay, ideally, you want a weed free field, but in the real world, you're not going to have that. So during my defense uh, last month, uh, my, uh, my supervisor asked me a question, what is a weed? So if this, if a plant species present in your field and that is going to, not going to cause a big loss, uh, why would you get rid of that weed? Instead, if that weed is going to um, cause a big 
crop loss and you're going to spend tons of money to manage it, then you should spend that money to control that weed. So mm -hmm. ideally, I think in the wild blueberry fields, there are some weeds are very important to control. So for example, hair fescue, golden roll, and uh, maybe other um, uh, weed species. But if, so for example, poly or grass in the field, they are not going to give you a big crop loss if the density is not very high. So why would you spend that money to control and to put herbicide in the field, right? So it's mm -hmm. important for you to understand what kind of weeds you have, and then you can start thinking, okay, is it worth the money for me to put those money into herbicide or other um, pesticide to control, um, uh, control those uh, pests in my field? So mm -hmm. hopefully that, that is, that's an interesting question. And everybody asks me, how do I keep a weed free uh, a field? And to be honest to you, I visit so many fields, I never see a weed free field in. <laughs> I don't think that exists in yeah, any no. field. <laughs> part of the nature and uh, you gotta respect that every uh, plant species they want to spread and they want to grow. But just make sure that you know what you need to uh, have input to keep that year up and you don't want to waste the money putting extra herbicide mm -hmm. or fungicide or whatever to waste the money and yeah. Yeah, all about balance. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. as I said in the video and as I repeat again and again, importantly, it's just make sure you understand what you have in the field and then if you need help to identify weeds in wild blueberries, then I'm happy uh, to help. My contact is in Poenia website you were able to see my phone number and my email address in, in the website. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so again, Hugh, you're popular today. Um, do you have to mow the field before applying Spartan for sheep sorrel? Um, depends one, that question, I, I don't know. I have to get this question down and is Rindo else? I will contact you and then get back with the answer. Yeah, like uh, we're still working out the research on that timing for for Spartan a little bit as well too. Uh, I think in in general, uh, I think you got to go out and have a look at your field in October and just look down. And if you're looking down, you can see the sheep sorrel and it's green and actively growing. Then maybe you don't have to mow. Uh, but with the leaves and and stems still being there, sometimes uh, I think you might be better to do the mow and then put on the the uh, the Spartan after that. But the windows. Mm -hmm. Uh, it can be hard to hit on it. So I think it's still one that we need to do a little bit more research on. But uh, mm -hmm. the first rule of thumb is if you're looking down and you don't see the sheep sorrel, like it's still underneath the canopy that it's being hidden, uh, maybe hold off on the spray or, or try one of the other timings. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, any word on flazosulfron certification for fescue and blueberries? Mm. I know Phrasosophium is, uh, in the research I held before, Phrasosophium is one of the uh, um, great herbicide to help to control uh, hair fescue, but I'm not sure if that rigid is approved to use in uh, wild blueberries yet. Yeah, no, I think it, it is in at the PMRA, but it hasn't come back out yet. So I think it's, it's one that, uh, fingers crossed, it's coming, but uh, uh, as of right now, I haven't seen anything on it. Okay, great. Something that maybe is coming down the pipeline, but we'll wait and see. Um, what is available in wild blueberry uh, for control of goldenrod and St. John's wort other than Callisto? So for controlling go uh, goldenrod, I know Callisto is working, but it requires multiple application in the growing season. However, mm -hmm. uh, multiple application of Callisto is no which is in Nova Scotia in Canada. It is approved in the United States, but it's known in, uh, in, in our province. So that uh, uh, some of the research I held before, we have approved that, but it needs to be bring up to the uh, registration table and then get it approved uh, for multiple mm -hmm. Yeah, and so besides that, um, um, Crystal is really that one that I think is working. I know, um, 
Yeah, you know, the other the other thing to to maybe consider depends on when you get your height difference there. But a good wipe would be the other option. Uh, you know, it can be difficult if it's the narrow leaf, uh, goldenrod, just because it, it's not getting much taller than the blueberries. But uh, mm -hmm. that would be the other thing to consider. And then the if you're trying to improve the efficacy on the Callisto, it's maybe layering it with uh, you know do the veil part early and then come back with the Callisto. You'll you'll probably get a little bit better uh, control on your goldenrod that way too. Okay, great. Thanks. All right, I think that covers all our questions from participants. Um, any final words or final thoughts from our panelists? Caitlin, I think there's one question in the chat area. Oh, oh yeah, sorry, I missed that. Uh, can you comment on the difference between weeds that are associated with a region and those specific to blueberry? So um, for that question, I only did the weed survey and most research in Nova Scotia, so I only can comment uh, in Nova Scotia uh, blueberry fields. So when I did the survey uh, from 2017 to 2019, I did find uh, there's a difference between the central Nova Scotia and the southern uh, south shore counties of Nova Scotia that we uh, have different um, weed species present. Um, so, for example, when I uh, when I was down in the south shore in the Caledonia area, we found that grassy buckthorn was kind of like a big uh, a weed um, in blueberries, but in the central Nova Scotia, in Truro or in Collingwood or Colchester area, it doesn't seem like a big problem yet, but I think it's coming. So different er, different regions in Nova Scotia do have different uh, weeds uh, present in the field. And um, when I analyzed my my data, we didn't realize analyze it by regions. We analyzed by whole province. But it will be int interesting to see and analyze all of this data into different regions, see what particular weeds in that region they have comparing to our other different regions. Mm -hmm. yeah. But in yeah. overall, that, uh, that research result and the table we show um, in my research, in my thesis paper, is pretty uh, good uh, overall conclusion of the weed species in Nova Scotia blueberry fields. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, for those trying to minimize the use of herbicides, what other weed management practices would you recommend? It's not specifying a crop, so let's hear from all three. Jen, let's start with you. Sure. Um, I'd say some of the cleanest fields that I've been in have been ones that are cultivated repeatedly early in the season. Um, so shortly after you start um, and, and again, doing it simply with the, the runners, I should say. So, but cultivating has made a, makes a huge difference for producers um, and can get you quite late into the season until you're concerned that you'll be actually moving runners. And at that point in time, then really your option is just uh, doing hand weeding, but it should get you quite far. Great. Michelle, you wanna go next? Sure. So uh, in orchards, sometimes um, some growers will use mulch uh, underneath the trees. That can become very tricky because then, um, you know, depending on how thick that mulch gets, you're inviting rodents to come and chew on the bark. So that can be um, a very negative outcome. And then instead, you're looking to some rodent, uh, some rodenticides to try to deal with that problem as well. Um, also, if you start using mulch, then that means that you can't use residual herbicides because you need to have the bare ground um, in order to uh, use those products. So, you know, you'll hear in the podcast uh, with Kristen Obeid that um, she's not really a fan of using mulch either. So, um, I'm not, I'm not sure um, what else to say about that, but um, Oh, there, there actually is a grower this year who's trying a finger weeder. So there's some new technologies yeah. coming out. Yes, yeah, so I'll be interested to follow up with that and, and see how that's working for them. But I imagine it'll be staying on top of weeds in their early growth stages, trying to uh, get them out, which can be uh, also a bit of a challenge. Yeah, lots of, uh, lots of labor involved there, but 
keeping it clean at the beginning can set things off on the right foot. Yeah. All right, Hugh. Okay, so uh, in, for all crops and in general to understand what kind of weeds you have. So you minimize the using herbicide. Uh, in wild blueberries, I know that make sure you clean your tractors and your farm machine before you travel from one field to the other. Because as I say, the hair fast QC will caught in the harvester or other machines and then you bring mm -hmm. the seeds from this field to the other field that would just spread everywhere. So make sure you clean your farm equipment before you travel or before you use for next season. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's great advice. Biosecurity so that you're minimizing that spread and uh, yeah, makes a huge difference for sure. Great. Yeah, and the only things I'd be adding to uh, when you're dealing both with strawberries and, and uh, apples or perennial crops are going to be in there for a little bit of time, right? So mm -hmm. the more work you can do in those years prior to planting, uh, the better off you're going to be is to really key in on cleaning those fields up before you get those plants in the ground to make sure that you've done the, the best job, especially on those perennial weeds, because as soon as if those perennial weeds are there in, in year one, you're, they're, they're going to be there for the whole planting. Uh, so yeah. just to make sure you try to, to clean them up that way. Yeah, no, that's great advice. All right. I think that's it this time. <laughs> if anybody has any other questions, then you can find all of the specialist contact information on our website and feel free to reach out to them that way. Um, so just in conclusion, I'd like to thank you all for coming to our virtual field days. Um, and thank you to our panelists today, our specialists, and big thanks to Gavin. Um, yeah, we, we've enjoyed this process and it was nice to be able to connect with people, um, even though we can't see you all in the field. So thank you very much and a big thank you to uh, Rachel, who is on our marketing team and is our producer for this whole event. So, all right, have a great day, everyone. And uh, hopefully we can see you in the field again soon. <laughs>